and welcome to American Catholic History, brought to you by the support of listeners like you. If you value this content, please become a supporter at AmericanCatholicHistory.org slash support. I'm Noelle Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. We've not released an episode in a while, and a lot has been going on. But we will be getting back to a regular schedule in the coming months. Yes. For those who didn't catch our update episode, the brief version is, I am in the middle of a ridiculously intense training program for the for Montessori elementary education, and it is taking up basically all of my time. Plus, we have fully separated from StarQuest Production Network, so we're working out the details of how we're getting these episodes edited and to you all. So for those who are supporting us, thank you. You really mean so much to us, and we are, we are very grateful. Absolutely. Thank you very sincerely. We will get back to a regular schedule. There are just too many amazing stories yet to tell for us to stop. But things are just a little jammed right now. <laughs> yes. But... You can still sign up for one of our upcoming pilgrimages. We'll be going back to Kentucky in late June of 2024 with a maximum of 12 pilgrims. So when it comes available, sign up quick. Absolutely. <laughs> it's a phenomenal trip. And then in late July or early August, where, di- where we are nailing down the, de- the uh, dates and other details, we will be heading to Wisconsin. Our Lady of Champion, the only approved Marian apparition in the United States, Our Lady of Guadalupe Shrine, which was established by Cardinal Burke when he was bishop there in La Crosse, Holy Hill, St. Josephat, Green Bay, Milwaukee, Cheese, Bratz, Beer, you know, all the Catholic and, and Wisconsin things. <laughs> it's really going to be a great trip. So get details to join us at AmericanCatholicHistory.org slash pilgrimages. Right. When we get them up there. <laughs> yes, we will. <laughs> As we said, still working out some of the details, but we're, we're close. Yes. Um, yeah, but we hope to see you there Absolutely. at both of our pilgrimages. Okay, so all that said, on with the show. Today, as we're making a new start on our own, we're revisiting our very first topic, the amazing Margaret Hari. Hari was an immigrant orphan widow, and she lost her only child all by the time she was 23. But she also was an entrepreneur, philanthropist, and one of the most beloved people in the city of New Orleans. As the Archbishop of New Orleans said at her funeral, she was one who let the light shine through. And apparently she was known and beloved beyond New Orleans. When she died, the crucifix that laid atop her coffin was one she'd received as a gift from Pope Pius IX. Yeah. Her memory was so cherished that just two years after she died, an impressive statue of her was erected in New Orleans with just the word Margaret on it. That's all the people needed to know who she was. This was in 1884, and it was only the second statue erected in honor of a woman in the United States and the first on public land. So that's a bit about her. Some of you may have listened to our previous episode about Hari, and you may remember the main points and some of the great stories, but you know, we've found a lot more information, and frankly, that, epi- that first episode was, you know, it was just kind of rough. <laughs> yeah, well, we hadn't figured out what we were doing then. Yeah, no. So we're, we're very happy to take a second look at Margaret Hari and sort of relaunch our podcast here on our own. So all that said, let's talk more about one of our favorite figures from American Catholic history, Margaret Hari. Sure thing. Margaret was born in County Leitrim, Ireland, on Christmas Day in 1813 to William and Margaret Gaffney. Margaret, the Margaret we're talking about, was the fifth of their six children. Now, County Leitrim is in the northwest part of the island of Ireland, and William was a tenant farmer. He owned, well, he was a tenant farmer of a small farm there in County Leitrim. The family was Catholic, and while the anti-Catholic penal laws were mostly repealed by this point, things were still kind of difficult for Catholics in Ireland. The Gaffneys were not wealthy. And in 1816 and 1817, two bad years of crops meant they were even worse off. William and his wife, Margaret, decided that the best opportunity they had to provide for their children was to move to the United States. So, in 1818, when Margaret, the daughter, was five, William and his wife emigrated with the three younger children, Kevin, Margaret, and Kathleen. The family could not afford passage for everyone, so the three older children were left with an uncle in Ireland. 
The Gaffney's plan was to save up money once they were in the United States and eventually bring, the, bring over the eldest three children. But that day never came. No, but more on that in a moment. The Gaffneys endured a very difficult voyage across the Atlantic. The ship got blown hundreds of miles off course. Food rations were reduced to little more than a couple of crackers each day. Starvation and typhus killed many. The Gaffneys' luggage was lost. The Gaffneys survived what turned out to be a six-month sea voyage, but the youngest Kathleen died shortly after arriving in Baltimore. The remaining four Gaffneys set about making a new life for themselves, but it was not destined to be a life of prosperity that they had hoped for. Uh, no. In 1822, just four years after they arrived in Baltimore, one of the many yellow fever epidemics that swept through the city claimed both of Margaret's parents. They both died, and her older brother abandoned her, never to be seen again. At nine years old, Margaret was an orphan in a strange land, abandoned by her only relation. A Welsh woman named Richards, who had befriended the Gaffneys on the voyage from Ireland, took pity on Margaret and welcomed her into her home. Margaret more or less earned her keep as a domestic servant in the Richards' home. So, for the next dozen years, Margaret learned to earn her keep through hard work. But, she never actually learned to read or write through all of that hard work. Yeah, which will come in as a kind of an interesting feature for the rest of her life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but frankly, if she had started at nine, learning to read or write wouldn't be easy. That sensitive period had more or less passed. <laughs> well, that doesn't mean she couldn't learn to read just much, much harder, right? Absolutely. Yes, I see you've been paying attention in your Montessori training. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> it's good stuff. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so Margaret worked for the Welsh woman until she was 21, and that was when she married another immigrant from Ireland, Charles Harry. They were married in 1835 in the Cathedral of the Assumption in Baltimore, that beautiful church we know today as the Baltimore Basilica. Within a month or two, they moved to New Orleans, Louisiana. Thousands of Irish were moving to New Orleans at the time. It was the fourth largest city in the nation, the second largest port city, and it was one of the most important cities for growth and new opportunities in the still-growing United States. The Haris had great reason for hope. Less than a year later, their daughter, Frances, was born. But that was more or less the last happy thing that happened to the Hari family. Yes, and things deteriorated rapidly. Charles Harry, who had always had frail health, took ill before Francis was born. Shortly after Francis's birth, Charles took the advice of a doctor that a sea voyage back to Ireland would help with his illness. But it did not. Shortly after arriving in Ireland, Charles died. Then a few months later, Francis took ill, and she also died. Margaret Harry all of 23 years old, had lost her entire family for a second time. <laughs> now, I know that death was much more of a part of a life for people back then, but still, that much tragedy in so short a time, I, I simply just can't imagine it. You know, one, one account says that the night Frances died, Margaret just held her all night, singing to her as though she were still alive. And in the morning, she brought her to the parish church where her pastor, Father Mullen, Arranged, arranged a funeral and burial, and did what he could to comfort the devastated widow and mother. I, I just can't imagine it. Margaret was understandably near despair, right? Yeah. Though she could not write, someone, perhaps Father Mullen, recorded her saying, My God, thou hast broken every tie. Thou hast stripped me of all again. I am all alone. And she was all alone again in a strange city. They had only moved there like a year before. Right. New Orleans at the time was not a hospitable place either for an Irish widow. The elite of the city, though mostly Catholic, were French and Creole Catholic. They were educated and had a sense of bearing, which the Irish immigrants generally, well, they didn't really have that. Well, no, it was, it's so understandable. I mean, it wasn't the Irish upper classes fleeing Ireland and looking desperately for jobs in the New World. I mean, naturally, the stable, established locals of New Orleans would develop a poor opinion of the hoi polloi clogging up their fair city no matter where they came from. 
And Margaret, being a single woman, had the disadvantage which came from that status as well. Women in that society generally didn't do much. They just were. Unless they entered a religious community, they were expected to marry and have children. And, well, that's about it. Married women had no right to own property. Anything they owned before marriage became their husband's. Only if their husbands died would they regain the right to own property or to dispose of property. Women almost never headed up businesses or worked as the sole breadwinner, no matter what. So Margaret, being a single childless woman, Irish, and not a religious sister, well, she was in a tough spot. Uh, Yeah, but not all Catholics in town took a dim view of a single Irish Catholic woman. First was her parish priest, Father Mullen. He helped Margaret through the devastating losses of her beloved husband and daughter, and then helped her get a job as a laundress at the new St. Charles Hotel. And this job proved to be the beginning of great things for Margaret and for the children of New Orleans. Right across the street from the St. Charles was the Julian Poydras Orphan Asylum. The Poydras Orphanage was bursting with children in those days because of the annual epidemics and other dangers that killed their parents. Margaret naturally had a special interest in the plight of orphans, and she would watch them play. It didn't take her long to make the acquaintance of the Sisters of Charity who ran the orphanage. The Mother Superior, Sister Regis, became a dear friend and something of a guide or mentor to her, perhaps even sort of like the mother figure she sorely lacked since her own mother died so many years earlier. Margaret began to donate all of her earnings that she did not need to live on to the sisters and the orphanage. Up to two-thirds of her wages at times went straight to the orphanage. And soon she took up residence at the orphanage, doing whatever the sisters needed in exchange for room and board. When she saw a need, she worked to fill it. And that meant everything. When the children had no food, she went to the market and either begged or bought food for them. She was not afraid to flash a smile or schmooze a grocer to get a good deal on food for the orphans. Um, She had a good deal of Irish charm, so I hear. (laughs) clearly worked, yes. And then the big break really happened. Margaret noticed how much money the sisters spent on milk and thought it wasn't right that they should spend so much. So... She took a loan from Father Mullen and bought two cows to provide milk for the orphanage. Now, I call this a big break because something seemed to change in Margaret when she got those cows. She had been accustomed to doing hard work and taking nothing for granted already, but up to this point, she was more or less content to work to live and work to give everything away. With these cows, a new possibility opened up. She could make money through her own industry, not as a wage earner, but as an entrepreneur. The cows provided more milk than what the orphanage needed. So after supplying the orphanage, she would go around selling the surplus milk. Orphans gladly helped out, helping to push the rickety old wheelbarrow she used to transport her milk jugs. When demand outran supply, she did the smart capitalist thing. She got more cows to increase her supply. By the end of the 1830s, her small herd had grown from 2 to 40 cows. By this point, she wasn't just selling excess milk. She had grown her inventory to include butter and cheese. She was doing quite well selling milk and dairy products and still using her funds to support the orphanage. When the sisters needed a new home for women, she was the major contributor. The new home opened in 1840. Her dairy business only expanded through the 1840s and into the 1850s. Those decades also saw the need for orphanages grow in New Orleans. There were two reasons for this growth. First, the potato famine in Ireland meant more Irish were coming to New Orleans. The second reason was that the annual yellow fever epidemic would kill as much as 10% of the city's population every year. So naturally, that meant a lot of orphans. And that's an unimaginable statistic. A city that just accepts that it could lose up to 10% of its people every year. I know. I mean, disease and death were much more... Yeah, they were much more a common thing to see around you back back then before modern medicine and the understanding of germs and infection. But just, wow, that's exceptional. And it certainly meant more orphanages. Well, Margaret helped to build more orphanages and homes for single women and widowed mothers. 
she also would visit homes where illness had taken hold, doing what she could for the families. She had a heart of gold and an endless ability to work hard. That came in handy when she invested in a bakery sometime in the 1850s. She eventually became the largest shareholder in that business. When she heard that it was on the verge of bankruptcy again, she took over the operations of the bakery. She didn't know much about baking at the time, but she knew about hard work and how to run a business. She called this new business simply Margaret's Bakery, and in a short time, it was far more successful than her dairy business had ever been. She sold off her herd of cows and left the dairy business to focus on the bakery. Before long, she was known all over New Orleans as the bread woman. People who never knew that she'd operated a dairy business knew about her bread. One way she stayed ahead of the competition was by always looking to stay current with the latest equipment. She had no problem working hard, but she also knew that Maxim works smarter, not harder. Well, if she was already a hard worker, then the smart thing would be to invest in equipment that would further maximize the effectiveness and efficiency of her hard work. She definitely seems to have lived that out. Keep in mind that she still had never learned to read or write. She had to have others read things to her and write letters at her dictation. This did lead to a few legal issues when she understood a business agreement to have been one thing, but the language of the actual contract said something different, and she wasn't able to parse the language herself. She lost a few contractual disputes. In one case, the judge expressed his sympathy for her and expressed his admiration, but said that he had to rule against her because of how the law and the contract were written. But that didn't dim her spirits or harm her progress. She still gave generously to orphanages and homes for women. She also made sure that they were well supplied with bread, selling it to them basically for cost. And she was also known to give bread to anyone who came to her begging. She would never let anyone go away empty-handed. Though, being a savvy woman who understood the seedier side of life, she never gave away a full loaf. She would always sort of cut it in half so the beggar couldn't turn around and sell it for cash to go buy alcohol. Very smart. Absolutely. Margaret's fortunes grew through the 1850s and into the 1860s, even as the clouds of war gathered and the Civil War exploded across the United States, Louisiana was the sixth state to secede from the Union in January of 1861. The Civil War officially began in April of that year, and it didn't take long for the Union to come for New Orleans. The Mississippi River, of course, was a vital artery for shipping and travel, so both sides wanted to control it. That meant controlling New Orleans. Union forces sailed up the Mississippi in early April 1862, and within a few days, Union forces entered New Orleans. This made New Orleans the first major Confederate city to be taken by the Union. It would remain in Union hands for the rest of the war. The people of New Orleans were not happy being conquered and governed by Federal forces, but what made it worse was the harsh rule of General Benjamin Butler. As the commander of the federal forces, he was in charge. He declared martial law and imposed a number of strict edicts that earned the ire of the people. Some of them, as harsh as they were, actually made some sense in a context of wartime occupation of a city in rebellion. They could be defended. Uh, but then there were some others that were just bad. Yes, one of the more egregious rules declared that any woman who insulted or even just showed contempt for any federal soldier, should be regarded and treated as a common prostitute. Even folks up in the North were outraged when they heard about that one. Yeah. Uh, as a side note, three of his efforts were actually quite good for the city. First, he instituted a modern system of garbage collection. A very good idea, especially in a city with a hot, wet climate. <laughs> yes. And second, he set up a network to help the poor and destitute. So while he was strict and sometimes harsh, he wasn't heartless. Right. And third, his method of preparing for and then handling the annual outbreak of yellow fever was very successful. That year, 1862, only two people died from yellow fever. As we said before, prior to this, the city just accepted that around 10% of its population would die from the disease every year. That's just so crazy. I know. So like, wow. <laughs> a, a little bit of prevention 
and all of a sudden only two people die. So that was good. Yeah. So anyhow, for good and bad, this was General Butler's world and everyone was just living in it. Except Margaret. Right. While General Butler had the charge of public order in a time of war, she had a different priority, helping people. And in a time of war, that need only increased as food became more scarce and supply chains for ingredients and resources were disrupted. Now, we don't know what Margaret's thoughts were on secession. She did have the aid of slaves. We found one account that mentions a slave boy named Anthony whom she treated like a son. You know, that makes sense. I, I really would find it hard to believe that someone with her background of tragedy and care for others, especially children, you know, treat, would treat slaves poorly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but she didn't let politics influence her efforts to help people. She aided federal forces, Confederate forces, and she didn't stop aiding the poor and needy. And this meant she had to move freely about the city to get supplies and to deliver aid. Well, by General Butler's orders, the city was filled with barriers and checkpoints to limit travel. Curfews controlled when people could be out and about. Margaret more or less ignored them all. She had to get supplies and make deliveries, and by golly, she was going to do it. She wasn't going to let some trifle like a war stop her helping the poor. <laughs> she was warned multiple times and threatened with jail if she did not heed the rules. Finally, she was brought before General Butler himself. Butler undoubtedly knew who she was and what her reputation was, but he couldn't just let her get away with flouting the rules. He ordered her to obey the checkpoints and barriers. Margaret asked if it were President Lincoln's orders that the poor be starved to death. General Butler barked, You are not to get through the picket lines without my permission. Is that clear? Margaret replied coolly, Quite clear. General Butler then replied, You have my permission. I just love that story. <laughs> He probably knew that she was going to just keep right on doing what she was doing. He also knew she wasn't a threat, and he didn't want to have the PR nightmare of either putting her in prison or having her shot on sight. But regardless, Margaret was given that permission, and she kept right on fulfilling her life's mission of helping those in need. After the war, her bakery flourished and her fame spread. Her bakery, still called Margaret's Bakery, became the first in the South to employ revolutionary steam baking technology. She also devised a method to package her crackers and bread such that they remained crisp and fresh for weeks. You know, this seems simple and obvious to us in an age of plastics and easy vacuum seal packaging, but it was quite unique back then. Yeah, right. So... That meant that Margaret's crackers were favorites aboard seafaring vessels, and New Orleans had lots of those. Oh, yeah. And this may be how her name came up with Pope Pius IX. At some point, her name and her reputation as a great philanthropist and a great Catholic lady came to his attention. So, as a token of his esteem, the great Pope blessed and sent to her a crucifix. She was perhaps the most admired person in New Orleans, if not all of Louisiana. She received visits from people of all levels of society. The poor sought compassion and material assistance. The wealthy and powerful came to her for counsel and wisdom. She was already known as the bread woman of New Orleans, but she also became known as the mother of the orphans, the angel of the Delta, and as just our Margaret. During her life, she contributed to the construction of many orphanages and homes. She gave personal assistance to countless hundreds, if not thousands, of people. When she was 69 years old, she contracted an unknown disease. She deteriorated rapidly and lingered in the care of her dear friends, the Sisters of Charity. Her death in February of 1882 was considered a public calamity, and the newspaper ran her obituary on the front page, edged in black. She was given a state funeral at the Cathedral of St. Louis. The Archbishop of New Orleans, Napoleon Joseph Perche, presided. The cathedral was so packed, the pallbearers had difficulty carrying her down the aisle. Her funeral procession included 13 priests. It was led by the mayor of New Orleans, and two lieutenant governors of Louisiana served among the pallbearers. At her own request, she was buried in the same tomb as her dear friend, Sister Regis, who had died 20 years earlier in 1862. When she died, Margaret still had $40,000 to her name. That's the equivalent of $1.2 million today. 
During her lifetime, it was estimated that she gave away around $600,000, which is roughly the equivalent of $14 million in today's money. It's just crazy. I mean, just mind-boggling. I know. It's from amazing. selling dairy and bread. Yes. I mean, <laughs> It's just crazy. In her will, she gave it all to charities and orphanages, you know, and of course, a large amount to the Sisters of Charity, but also some money to build the St. Teresa of Avila Church, which is very near the monument that was built for her eventually, which we'll talk about in a moment, hmm. and to charities run by Protestants and Jews. Her goal, as always, was to help as many children and indigent mothers as possible, regardless of race, creed, ethnicity, etc., but she was able to have so much when she died because of how she lived. She lived with the sisters until she purchased the bakery when she built a small apartment above it. And she never spent much on herself. She never had more than two dresses, and she lived very simply. Within weeks of her death, an effort was underway to erect a monument to her. The groundswell of support was huge. A committee organized fundraising, but they insisted on the entire project being funded by small donations— all nickels and dimes. No large sums were, were to be accepted. A sculptor crafted a clay model which was sent to Italy to be carved in Carrera marble. The final version cost about $6,000 and it was unveiled and dedicated on July 9, 1864, a little more than two years after her death. In the monument, Margaret is seated in a white chair wearing a simple sweater and a long gingham dress skirt. She is a stout, strong woman, and next to her is a child looking up to her and leaning in for a hug. On the base of the monument is a single word, Margaret. For New Orleanians, no other name mattered and no other indication was necessary. The monument was, as we said before, the second erected to a woman in the United States, but the first erected in a public place on public land. It was also the first of a female philanthropist and the first monument erected to a baker. Pretty cool. But those firsts don't matter to the people of New Orleans as much as the great good that she did. In recent years, interest in Margaret Hari has reignited both in New Orleans and in her native county, Leitrim, Ireland. Her birthplace has been recreated near Carrigallen, and a documentary film is in production. In New Orleans, a restoration effort cleaned and repaired the Margaret Monument over the last decade. This effort, fittingly, was funded in part by city bakers. Quite an impact and legacy for an illiterate immigrant orphan widow. Makes me feel like... What, what, what are we doing? I've been huh? doing? I know, really. <laughs> it really is amazing. She, I mean, no more complaining about your Montessori training. Hey now, stop that. <laughs> I'll complain. <laughs> she is one of my favorite people in American Catholic history, and I need to learn a lot from her. Yes. At Margaret's funeral, Archbishop Perche said, I have already been asked whether Margaret Hari, who lived and labored so long and well amongst us, was a saint. It is not for me to make a pronouncement, but if you put this same question to yourselves, dear brethren, you may find an answer similar to that which a little boy once made when a sister in our Sunday school inquired that somebody define a saint. I think, said the child, remembering the human figures in stained glass windows, that a saint is one who lets the light shine through. Margaret Hari certainly let the light shine through. This has been American Catholic History. If you enjoy American Catholic History, please become a supporter. We've got great perks for supporters. Get information on how to become a supporter and the perks at AmericanCatholicHistory.org slash support. Also on our website, sign up for our newsletter, learn more about Margaret Hari, and see about our pilgrimages, and find other great stories from American Catholic history. Yeah. Also, you can uh, check out our merch there. We have some great figures from American Catholic history to put on t-shirts and other items, but not Margaret Hari. you got to have some sort of like Margaret Hari crackers that we sell. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe coming. Not a bad idea. <laughs> yes. We also love the great reviews our listeners leave. Those and the five-star ratings help others find us. 
You can also email us feedback, questions, tips for episode topics, and other comments at feedback at AmericanCatholicHistory.org. You can find us on Facebook at Facebook.com slash American Catholic History, on Instagram at ACH underscore podcast, and follow us on Twitter at ACH1513. I'm Noelle Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. Thank you once again for joining us on American Catholic History made possible by listeners like you. Orphans gladly helped out, helping to push the rickety old whale... whale barrel. Whale barrel! <laughs> hey, you got there a whale barrel! That's a... That there's a rickety old whale barrel! Got any whales on that barrel? I'm sorry. Quiet.